Hey guys, welcome to the Savvy Real Estate Investor Show. Uh, we got another episode here and I'm pretty excited about this one because we have a former NFL player who transitioned over into real estate and I'm thrilled about digging into this and dissecting everything he's got to tell us about that. Uh, his name is Yannick. Yannick, welcome to the show. Thanks, Satch. Thank you so much for having me and I'm excited to, uh, to be here today. Love it, man. Uh, I'm going to give us a quick bio by Yannick. Uh, Yannick Cujo, he is the principal of Merlin Acquisitions. Uh, Merlin Acquisitions is a Baltimore-based real estate investment and syndication firm. Uh, they have 5.8 million assets under management. Uh, their experience is in commercial real estate, and he began as an asset manager uh, for retail and institutionally capitalized real estate private equity firms. Uh, that have over $1.5 billion in assets under management. And that's where he oversaw multidisciplinary portfolios consistent of multifamily, mixed-use, office, uh, retail, and industrial properties across the U.S. So very, very diverse background there. And, uh, dude, a lot of experience I'm sure you probably got from working with this, um, with this uh, company there, uh, working with these private equity firms. Um, so I love that, man. Let's let's dissect this into what I'm very curious about is is your background, man. Going from NFL to getting into real estate. Uh, so Yannick, why don't you tell us how was that journey? Why why what happened in the NFL? Why did you gravitate to real estate? How was that like? Absolutely. So my story is I'm a former NFL player, played linebacker for the Tennessee Titans, and unfortunately like some NFL players, my career was ended early. Uh, I blew my knee out early on in my career, had multiple surgeries, didn't know exactly what was going to happen after real estate. We had a, a bunch of organizational changes with the Tennessee Titans. And for me, I had to get to a red pill moment, right? Which is figuring out, you know, what is my next step? And fortunately for me, I read a book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which I'm pretty sure you probably read as well. And this was you know, a great time for me to read that book because a month prior I had spent about $20,000, you know, in one month in the off season and I had no idea what I spent it on. And you've heard all of the statistics in the past, you know, 70s or 80% of athletes go broke within, you know, three years after leaving the NFL. And I did not want to be a part of that statistic. I wanted to make sure that I was, you know, taken care of financially after the game. So for me, real estate was an opportunity to transition out of the NFL, use some of the same talents and characteristics that I've developed through sport into real estate to grow where we are today, which is a syndication firm. Love it, man. And what do you think are some of those uh, qualities that you think that translate from, uh, playing sports and professionally in real estate. Absolutely. So I like to say that business is a team sport and real estate is no exception, right? So for me, I've been in a lot of different leadership roles from being a captain throughout my sporting career, uh, being able to handle adversity. I can't tell you how many times we've had to handle adversity on the football field. You know, some of those qualities easily translate into the entrepreneurship space having that discipline to wake up early in the morning, having the, um, you know, the strength to push through, push through ob obstacles, you know, little things like that, that's translatable into the entrepreneurship um, space. So, you know, that's really what I had to leverage to get into real estate because I didn't have any finance background. You know, I thought that I was going to play 10 years in the NFL. I did kinesiology at the University of Maryland. So I wanted to own a gym and just retire off into the sunset. But fortunately, um, you know, I was able to latch onto that book and, you know, transition well into the real estate space while leveraging my talents and characteristics and traits from the sporting realm. That is so funny, man. I think Rich Dad Poor Dad has changed more people's lives than we can even think of, right? Uh, that's the <laughs> book that changed my life as well, man. <laughs> um, so it's definitely it's definitely an eye opener. Um, that's pretty awesome. How many people do you think have the same vision as you when you were in the NFL? Sort of like you know, be ten years, rack up the cash, retire into the sunset, do X afterwards. 
Absolutely. So I think everyone to a, to a degree, I think, you know, if you were, if you were to ask anyone in the NFL, you know, how long do you want to play? It's for some reason, the magic number is 10 years. I don't know why it is, but it just, it sounds really good, right? I'm a 10 year vet played in the NFL, played professional sports. So I think everyone to, you know, for, for the most part wants to play that, you know, 10 year span where they can, you know, make a bunch of money, hopefully get three contracts and, you know, retire off. But the reality is, is that, the average lifespan in the NFL is only about three years, right? The average lifespan is about three years. The the average lifespan is about three years. And so the reality is a lot of people don't get the opportunity to get to that 10 year mark. And so what I try to do is leverage my experience, my transition to inspire someone to be able to make that next step out of the NFL, because think of it like this. Your entire life, you were told how good you are in a sport. You create this identity about yourself. You know, I've created this identity about myself for 25 years. You know, I retired. I'm 29 now. I retired around 25. And when you are unable to to live up to that identity, it's it's an identity crisis, right? You go through a, a stage of figuring out, you know, who you are as a person. What do you want to be remembered for this whole different identity crisis? And so a lot of players struggle with that transition because, A, they're trying to figure out exactly what they're going to do, who they are. And then, B, their entire life, they're they're dedicated to get to one level, which is the NFL. So nine times out of ten, they they don't focus on anything else, right, because they want to get to that 1% level, professional sports, that is it, or nothing. And so the transition for the modern day athlete, NFL, NBA is extremely tough from that perspective. But I think moving forward in today's environment, things are getting much better from education, things that are out there on social media, YouTube, where athletes are starting to um, idealize or model athletes like LeBron James, who just became the first billionaire right. <laughs> you know, yeah. athlete, right? Or the late, great Kobe Bryant. You know, all of his investments into different businesses and the things that he did well off of the field. So things are starting to change and I'm excited to be a part of, um, you know, the stories to, to tell. I love it, man. I think uh, like they say, right, success leaves clues and uh, whatever you're doing, if you are a professional uh, a sports player, uh, if you play sports professionally and you just model after the people that are obviously very successful and you see what they're doing, you see Shaquille O'Neal, uh, he does a lot of real estate stuff as well, right? Like you mentioned, LeBron James and all of his investments. And um, I think some people uh, are able to uh, catch on to the idea that you got to do something outside of uh, whatever you're playing, but some people just see the you see the parties and the money and the cars and they get persuaded to go in a different direction. Right. So those are, those are the, like the two ways that people can gravitate pretty quickly. Um, dude, what's, I'm kind of curious to know what's your, um, biggest objection as you're trying to, um, break into the field of bringing your real estate investments, uh, for NFL players, because I'm assuming a lot of these guys are, these are multi-million dollar earners uh, per year, right? And they have access probably to top financial experts in the industry, in any industry. What do you think differentiates uh, what you bring to the table as far as real estate goes? And what's the hardest thing about bringing this new investment strategy to other players? Absolutely. So I think a lot of times, you know, NFL players, specifically professional athletes, because they are not very educated on just finance overall, they get this perception that they should only be making millions of dollars, right? So I try to let a lot of current and you know former athletes know that, hey, maximize what you have in this 10-year to 15-year span, right? This is the time where you're probably going to make you know, the most money that you can in your entire life if you don't translate that well outside of the sporting realm, right? Whether it's business, other investments. And so I liken it to 
their understanding of just being an overnight millionaire, right? Because they go from being broke college students to multimillionaires overnight, right? Essentially when they get drafted. And so a lot of times I am focused on educating them on what a good return is or what a market return is for the average person, right? And so a lot of times when I'm having those discussions, they are very aggressive in their risk profile because they're by nature, they're professional athletes, right? They are high risk, high return type of guys. I mean, I was myself, right? My first investment was Bitcoin in 2017, <laughs> right? Before the, the market popped. And so I still had, I had that, you know, aggressive risk profile and return profile, but it, it came down to just education and understanding that that return comes with a lot of risk. And so that's why you see a lot of athletes getting into investments where they lose a ton of money because they have this one financial advisor that pitches them, you know, this opportunity that makes a lot of money. And now they have the shiny object syndrome because, hey, that's that's all they know, right? It's, it's big checks, right? So a little check of, you know, 8% probably wouldn't get them, get them up in the morning, right? And so being able to create value through being able to let them know that, hey, this is an opportunity to create generational wealth. And you want to have that cash flow after you leave the NFL, right? Leave the NBA is you want to have that cash flow every single month to supplement the lifestyle that you've created in the professional sports space. And so it just comes down to education. You know, a lot of them are not, you know, very financially astute. Things are getting better. So I try to position myself as providing value to keep to allowing them to keep the money that they've made in the NFL for generations to come through multifamily investment. Dude, I love that, man. Love that. Um, you are in the you're you're you obviously are in syndications, uh, and you one of your expertise. Uh, is as we were talking prior is asset management, right? Um, how and why did you get into asset management? So I wanted to make sure that first and foremost, I understand that commercial real estate was a game that you really need to know what you're doing, right? Prior to me, you know, getting into commercial real estate, you know, I started doing flips. I was wholesaling. And I was doing some of that stuff while I got into commercial real estate. I started, started off in brokerage doing multifamily investment sales and office and retail tenant rep. I knew that I wanted to be in the on the principal side because I wanted to own assets in the future. So I had to find a way to get in the door. I didn't have any finance background. I didn't have anything that had to do with business. Again, I did kinesiology. So for me, I had to leverage my hustle and tenacity to just get in the door somewhere because I, I submitted a ton of applications and I was getting rejected left and right. But I knew that I was, if I was able to get in a room with someone and convince them that, Hey, I may not have the credentials today, but there's, there are educational opportunities out there that I can get up to speed exceptionally quick in commercial real estate asset management to provide value on your team. Um, and so essentially I, I leveraged my hustle to um, network and meet, different principles in the area. I latched onto this principal in uh, Washington, D.C., which was my first asset management job. Moved around to different asset management companies. Uh, been in the institutional space and the retail private equity space, managing a ton of different commercial real estate assets. And I wanted to learn on someone else's dime, right? Because Satch, as you know, when you're raising money using your network and using your own money, you want to make sure that you're doing everything correctly at a high level. So that was my strategy as to how I was going to get my education in real estate, specifically commercial real estate, was through asset management by learning on someone else's dime and then taking all of the resources and implementing the things that I've learned into my own business to be where we are today. I love that, man. So typically now when you put a, a real estate deal together, um, are you coming in on the GP side mainly working on the asset management aspect of the deal? Um, are you focusing also on capital raising? What kind of roles do you play on the GP side? So on the GP side, I am focused on um, asset management and construction management. And I like to say, you know, there's a lot of content out there on acquisitions on in multifamily specifically. 
right? But nobody really talks about the work that needs to be done after you close the property, right? There's a, you know, if you have a 50 unit building and you're modeling, you know, renovating, you know, at least half of those, that's 25 different rehabs that someone is responsible for, right? And so being able to manage the manager, manage the construction guys, manage, um, you know, all of the little things from getting materials, you know, to your storage units, um, you know, to a higher level of managing just the operations on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, overseeing your revenue growth, expense growth, occupancy rates, you know, turnover time, which is really big, making sure that, you know, those those uh, units are turned over in a, you know, timely fashion, um, because that has a direct impact impact on your pro forma, right? Um, all of those little, you know, little tasks and things that add up to being able to be successful in providing your investors a, a good return is extremely important in asset management. And so, um, again, that's the, that's really the reason why I wanted to, you know, learn um, professionally with, a you know, a job was to get all of that experience, you know, use all of that into, um, you know, uh, our, our business today. And so that's what I'm focused on is the asset management and the construction management. Uh, you brought a couple of good points that I, a lot of people ask me this, um, like investors that are interested in, in, in placing some of their capital in syndications and not it's not very well known the process of like a value add project right which we go in and the first phase which may last for the first year year and a half is turning all those units around uh you know obviously longer depending on how big this asset is but can you break down a little bit of how that typically looks like in a value add project uh from like how long are the units down People typically ask me like, hey, do you kick people out to renovate the units? And it's like, no, we're not going around kicking people out. Yeah. You know, that's like not good practice. But can you tell us some of your um, what are some of the best practices for asset management, successful, successfully managing assets and some of the things that um, break it down a little bit farther into like how everything yeah. looks from going from zero to completing a project? Absolutely. Absolutely. So I think, you know. Our goal as operators, investors, is we want to make a profit for our investors, right? But the challenge is we want to manage not having too much delinquencies because we don't want to piss off tenants. And now we're going into, you know, the, the red, right? Because we have too many, too much occupancy and all that stuff that we have to, to, to dig into. Um, as far as the value add, you know, proposition, you know, generally, you know, if you have, let's say, you know, 50 units, right? You try to do at least a third per year of that total sum, right? So whatever that that equates to, you try to do a third per year. And, um, you know, for us, we try to turn these units around in 30 days and then lease them, lease them up within the next 30. So um, a, a total 60, 60 day window, right? And, and you know, the, the vacancies and all that stuff, you know, that depends by market, right? So a softer market, you'd probably expect you know, maybe 90 days full turnaround, a stronger market, maybe 30 to 60. Um, but I think the, the some of the best practices and success in asset management, specifically when you're trying to uh, manage the, the the two sides between creating vacancies so you can increase rents between and, and also, um, you know, uh, kick maybe, I don't want to say kicking tenants out, but, you know, the balance between <laughs> creating vacancy, but also, you know, keeping your tenants in. I think for us, you know, we try to approach um, our tenants from, you know, creating value. So if we're going to increase rents, we say, hey, um, we're going to increase rents by, you know, X amount of percent. But, you know, is there something in your apartment that we could also, you know, fix right now? Right. Um, is there like, you know, some drywall that needs to be painted over? You know, do you need, um, you know, do you, do you need like a new doorknob, something? Because people want to generally feel like they, they're winning something. At the end of the day, right? If, if you're just jacking the prices and, and people feel like they're not getting the value out of it, then you know that's a negative effect on your assets. So we try to create value. Ask ask them something that you know if, if they need something fixed, um, because that's 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 important to us. We want to you know my mantra is heads and beds. I want to make sure that the beds are filled up with tenants and they're also paying as well. So I think that also comes into you know the holistic approach of just. Uh, making sure that you have good paying tenants and you build that community, you know, so people want to pay rent on time <laughs> as well. Right. So, um, yeah, those are some some best practices that we use. Love it, man. 
How do you know um, what kind of updates, repairs you need to do to an asset in that will get you the most value? Yeah, absolutely. So, so for us, you know, given the construction issues that you know the whole country is facing, supply chain issues, and the way that deals have been penciling in today's environment, we try to utilize all of the materials that are that are existing in the property as much as possible. So, if we have you know old black and white tile that's in the bathrooms, instead of replacing that tile, we'll just get someone to refinish it for maybe half of the cost, right? Um, instead of replacing cabinets, we try to paint it over to you know, save some cost, right? Um, vinyl plank flooring is not really that expensive, but you can also get a nice return on investment. Uh, you know, adding LED lights is also not ex ex you know, expensive, but just being able to create that lighting and that feel and that experience when you walk into a unit is something that you know, goes into the sales process of someone actually wanting to submit an application, right? So the little things like that is what we look for and, and, and being able to, to sell our properties, right? And also make our tenants happy, um, you know, within our, you know, our business. How low does a vacancy typically get as you're turning around units? So you're saying you will do about a third of the units at any given time, right? So like, just to keep the number simple, it is a 90 unit apartment complex. You're renovating, uh, that first year, you're renovating 30 units. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so, so that is the, that's essentially the, the goal, but there's also, you know, some, a lot of times, you know, as you probably already know, I've never had a deal that went exactly <laughs> as planned. Right. You know, our, our, our number one objective is to get returns for our investors. And so we're having a bunch of vacancy in the market, um, you know, and also, you know, our property, then we don't want to dip too low because we don't want to get to some sort of break even occupancy level, right? Um, we want to make sure that our property is occupied, but then also we have enough units to, to turn them over and increase the rent. So it's it's constantly, you know, one of those balances and 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 um, tough decisions that you have to make on your property. But for us, you know, at the end of the day, our investors are always first. You know, we pride on putting our investors first and making sure that we do what's best for them. Now, if we see an opportunity to, um, you know, you know, empty some units and we might have to take a dip in occupancy because, you know, there's so much padding between the existing rents um, versus the where the, the, the market rents are, you know, on renovated units, then we might take that gamble if we feel like there's an opportunity to really reposition this this property quicker than we, accept, than we expected. But at the end of the day, again, you know, our number one focus is protecting our investors, protecting their capital and make sure that we do the best thing for that asset. Love it, man. Yep. I agree with that. Cash flow and first position. Uh, I'll rather. So obviously kind of like I think breaking down a little bit farther, what you're saying is, sure, we can go as fast as we can renovating every single unit as, as they become vacant. But the risk is that cash flow will start going down. Right. And in my opinion, so like I don't do ground grand, uh, ground up construction because there is no cash flow. Uh, I know there's a lot of developers out there and we may have different points of views, but I would just not entertain anything that does not have cash flow because to me, that's number one. And I want in any market cycle, I want to at least worst case scenario, I want at least the property to pay for itself. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, my cash flow may go down, but I want the property to, I don't want to lose my asset just because there is no cash flow. Um, so I like what you're saying. So it always comes down to really what the numbers are saying and not just blindsided, just start renovating units without even paying attention to what the numbers are saying, right? Um, I like that. So is there, uh, uh, what do you typically find is the, this kind of might be a little bit of a, a number that differs from from asset and, and, and market, but what did you typically find to be the percentage at which, do you have a break even occupancy rate? Um, honestly, I think it, it varies by, you know, you know, a lot of different things. Maybe you're going in price or the, the type of debt that you're putting on to the property as well. Um, you know, especially when you are, you know, you might have a construction loan on that property that might have some sort of interest only period. And every time that you renovate units and you add on, you know, to that, to that debt, you know, your debt increases, especially, if we're in an environment today where floating rates are just, you know, super volatile, 
right, as we speak in July 2020, right? Um, so I think it, it kind of varies, you know, um, but I, the, the main thing is, you know, we want to make sure that our asset is protected. And so, you know, from a, from a break-even perspective, if it's, if it's you know, any, anywhere like 80% or so, um, that's something that, that, that would probably trigger us to um, be careful with this asset. So like, for example, um, if we, you know, let's say like a 20 unit property, right? Or a 15 unit property has a more, uh, is more susceptible to um, swings in that break even occupancy versus a hundred unit property, right? Because if you just one or two units that leave from a 20 unit deal, you know, you're, you're below 90%, right? Um, and that's important too, especially when you go for finance and when you go to Freddie Mac, you know, maybe a small balance loan and they're looking for 90, 90 for 90, you know, 90% occupancy in the last 90 days, you know, you can't have those swings in occupancy during, um, you know, when you're under contract, right? So I think, you know, from a percentage perspective, the more units, the better, because if you have you know, 100 units, that that's a, a bigger buffer on the property to protect you from any swings in occupancy. But you know, a small, smaller deal, like a 20 unit deal, I would definitely be a little bit more careful on that because any, you know, a few tenants leave, then you're, you know, you might be in the red, depending on, again, the type of debt you put on the property and the buy-in price and all that stuff. So, Dude, I want to, I want to bring up what you said there to make sure uh, we hammer it home. The more units, the better, right? And it's something that a lot of people uh, fight me about, you know, that they're like, uh, it's too risky. It's a lot of units. And, and I try to make them uh, see how the more units you have, the better a deal and the easier it is, right? There's, there is safer. Uh, it's more manageable. Once you've got past the 90 units, you can bring a professional property management team that is taking care of that asset itself, as opposed to having a property management team running across different areas in that market, uh, taking care of properties, right? And what you were just saying, if you have a duplex and one of those units uh, gets empty, you're down to 50%, right? Uh, as opposed to having a 100 unit apartment building and five units leave, you're at 95% occupancy, right? So um, I wanted to hammer that home, make sure that we got that one on there. The more units, the better. I love that. Um, dude, I'm, Tell me, tell me about a time that something went wrong per the business plan, and uh, how do you, how do you guys pick up the pieces and made it right? Absolutely. So um, I'll give an example. You know, one of our smaller deals, and again, we in the in the case of just <laughs> you know case in point, what you just mentioned, right? You know, we we did an eighteen unit syndication that um, you know again we modeled three three, uh, sorry, a third every year for the you know next, you know, two to three years. Right. Um, and so for us, what happened was we got kind of like a double whammy, right? We got some vacancy and non-paying tenants. <laughs> and that's something that is, that is not fun to deal with, right? When you have, it's one thing to have vacancy, but it's another thing to have non-paying tenants. So we ended up, you know, turning about six to seven to nine units within the first year of the property. Right. And so, you know, for me, it comes down to, you know, when things get tough, what do you rely on? You rely on your training, you know, what you were, you know, you, you were, you learned to do in your past, you know, different things that you deal with in your past. So for me, it just came down to, you know, focusing very heavily on being able to produce output, which is turning those units quicker um, quicker than 30 days as much as possible, getting those materials ready, everything so we can get the product online. And then also just focusing on just expenses as well, because we still need to carry the property, right? We still need to pay for those bills. We still, those tax bills don't don't <laughs> decrease just because we have a few vacant units, right? And so, you know, we turn the property around, right? Turn it around to, you know, more uh, occupied units, and um, just being able to really have that story to go out there and tell investors, because a lot of times, you know, it's easy for someone to tout, you know, their, their successes based off of when everything went according to plan. Right. But I think investors, you know, for anyone that's out there, you know, listening in today, you want to be with battle tested operators. You want to be with people who know 
how to deal with adversity because nothing goes right on these properties. And sometimes you might just get one or two properties that are just, oh man, we can't catch a break, right? But you want to know at the end of the day, that person who you're investing with is a fiduciary of your capital. And that person is going to do whatever it takes to turn that you know, business plan around and get you the returns or some something closer to the returns or as close as possible to the returns that you guys have, have um, you know, went out to, you guys have agreed on, right? For, for someone to make that investment with the operator. So, um, you know, for me, it's about being a battle-tested operator, leveraging everything that I've been through in my career, my professional career, and just applying that same mentality into real estate. And, you know, that's how we've been able to uh, be successful. I love it, man. I always say there's two questions as a minimum that you should ask a sponsor or syndicator is uh, tell me tell me about the deal that went wrong and uh, what did you do about it, right? You want to see them that be, to be resourceful, kind of what you're saying, right? You want to see them take charge, make things right, and, and like move quick, right? Uh, you don't want somebody that says, ah, oh, yeah, that happened and we just sat back and did nothing and, and then we lost the deal, you know? I want to see that, hey, they got up on, they got up from their chair and they got to work. Um, and number two is um, I want to see this current deal, like what, what can go wrong, right? Every deal, like we're saying, wait, we have a business plan, but at least I want to see ahead of time. And it's something that we did a lot in aviation is we call it threat, threat management, right? Obviously, we don't plan on crashing, but we try to foresee all of the possible threats along the way on that flight of things that can happen and how we're going to mitigate those risks, right? So I think that's it's crucial, uh, like what you're saying, make sure that the sponsor, the person you're investing with is battle tested, has been through a couple of things, and he can uh, solve issues as they arise because they will arise. Um, dude, so... Can people invest with you um, or are you more, are you, are you right now accepting investors? Can they come invest with you with deals? Are you putting deals out there for people or are you more, uh, are operators just seeking out to you directly for, to come and join their deals? No, no, we, we, um, so we, we, you know, raise private capital, you know, business owners, professional athletes, people who understand that hey, we're in this inflation environment today, right? And the government doesn't necessarily care about us too much, right? They just printed so much money into the into the market over the past 12 to 24 months. I mean, we just saw, what was it, last month, you know, today is, is July, you know, 2022, inflation rose to, you know, 9.1%, something that they, of that nature, right? So we like to partner up with people who understand um, economics and understand that, hey, you have to put this money to work. You know, inflation happens, but then also, you know, being able to have those different streams of income to create that freedom, which is really why I got into real estate, because I wanted the same lifestyle that I had to some degree in the NFL through real estate. And that is only created through investing, being able to create different streams of income and just overall creating generational wealth for for you know myself and and um, our investors, you know, family. So. Um, if anyone wants to reach out to our company, again, our company name is Merlin Acquisitions. It's MerlinAcquisitions.com, M-E-R-L-Y-N-N Acquisitions.com. And we have an amazing due diligence, due diligence checklist for anyone who is interested in multifamily trying to get their first deal done or anyone that's passive trying to understand the due diligence process of multifamily, which is extremely important when you're acquiring these properties. Um, you know, if someone wants to reach out to us, feel free to connect with us on the on the website through our investor group. And um, thank you so much for um, having me on the show. Yeah, absolutely, love it, Yannick. We'll, we'll have we'll have to have you again, man. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, thank you, thank you, everybody, for watching.